Hello, and welcome to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. On today's episode, we'll reach the conclusion of the 1972 novel Elric of Melniboné. Elric of Melniboné was the first true full length Elric novel, and a prequel to all those published in the 60s that were essentially collections of short stories, only occasionally linked by some kind of theme. Stormbringer, for example. Following the publication of Elric of Melniboné, most, if not all, of those existing stories would be reordered chronologically to support a more consistent narrative. In addition, Moorcock would add new stories to fill in a number of gaps in Elric's wanderings, and we'll get to those in due course, but for now, we just need to conclude our current business. When I kicked off this podcast back in October 2019, I had lots of great suggestions on Twitter regarding various other adaptations of Moorcock, be it music, comics, or just some really fantastic artwork. Thanks to those tips, I picked up a few cool articles, including a 70s comic adaptation of the original short story version of Behold the Man, a more recent comic version of Neil Gaiman's One Life furnished by Ailey Moorcock, and, more pertinently perhaps, the rather gorgeous oversized Elric of Melniboné graphic novels by Julian Blondell and Didier Polly. I was also prompted to dig deep into my library, and by library I mean boxes and piles in corners, as well as shelves scattered all over our pad in windy West Yorkshire, to dig out some old artefacts such as the Roy Thomas adaptations of Elric of Melniboné and Sailor on the Seas of Fate. At the time, my faulty memory had told me that they were falling to bits, but when I found them, it turned out they were in fairly decent nick. As soon as I can get them under Loz's nose, we'll do a show on the Thomas and Blondell takes on Elric of Melniboné, because there's definitely a lot to like and we may also crowbar in the Marvel version of Elric that debuted in the Conan comics in the 1970s, silly hat and all. But for now, we need to get our table up at Derry and Tom's roof garden, line up some interesting beers, and conclude our journey to run down the dastardly year Coon in the company of Elric of Manlibonet. Okay, we're back in Derry and Tom's roof garden with Loz to look at Elric of Melniboné part three. I can't believe we actually got to part three, but we did get to part three. But first of all, we need to talk about what we're going to have as an accompaniment. Indeed. Which is, tell us. Kentucky Riot, a Kentucky Stout mm. uh, from the Beatniks Republic. So, uh, yeah, Beatniks Republic are in Manchester, aren't they? They are. So I'm guessing it's a Kentucky style stout. Well, it's in it combines rich, dark speciality malts with uh, bourbon oak and muscovado sugar. Yeah, nice. It's been literally dry hopped. Right. Not my words. Well, the fabulous thing is, once we're actually out of the EU, we'll be able to call whatever we want anything, won't we? Exactly. So I'm I wouldn't gonna... be careful with the can because it's been <laughs> in my bag. Right. Okay. We don't want any explosions. Let's go. Ooh, we're in. We're off. We're in. Okay, so first up, let's have a test. Five percent, yeah. not bad. Mm. Yeah, that's quite pleasant. Yeah, that's really not bad at all. Yeah, we could do with a glass, really, if we're going to be sophisticated. But you know, fuck it. Well, if you <laughs> if you want to make some kind of strange pretense of being sophisticated, I can accommodate that. But frankly, I'm going to drink it out of the can like a savage. I'll join your savagery then. Okay, let's I'll stay bring savages. myself down to yeah. your level. <laughs> yeah, that's right, lower yourself. Yeah. Lower. Um, so, when we last left off, Elric had managed to get the ship that sails over Land and Sea. Land and sea. Yeah. Um, and that's, it's going to get really, really tiresome saying that over and over and over again, yeah. but we're just going to have to persevere. Um, and of course, before he set sail, there was a slight mishap with a sailor falling from the rigging and dying on the deck as kind of a uh, a doomed ermine of well, what is well, potentially to come. It's going to bum you out a bit, isn't it? Yeah. If you just sat around having a bit of a chat and somebody falls in front of you and then dies, mm. it's going to bum you out. Isn't yeah, it? it would a little bit. So Elric, Divim Tavar, the Imrerian crew and a bunch of um, Imrerian veterans are on the ship that sails over land and sea. Does it mention the veterans? Um, I think I, you, you, it, it you just says so. a company of veterans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we don't really know anything more than that. And the idea is that they're going to set off on a quest to track down the dastardly Yakun who's kidnapped Cimmeril and sodded off somewhere else to, to get up to no good. And they've heard a rumour that he's got a magic mirror. 
The elf, yeah. Mm. A magic mirror. Not that scary, is it? Yeah. Yeah. So they decide to avoid the boiling sea. Ah, the boiling sea. Get a brief description of the boiling sea that basically just says it's steamy. Yeah, and boiling. And boiling. Yeah. Hence the phrase. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that sounds cool. And we get a, a reference. Well, they decide to avoid the boiling sea, so they set sail for the port city of Ramasaz on the western shore of Lomia. We do. And we get a brief reference to uh, Lomia's fat, cautious King Ferdin. Oh, alas. <laughs> alas, poor Ferdin. Poor. Podgy lipped Ferdin. Yeah. 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 Who, uh, was, we know comes a cropper because we read the Dreaming City first. He did, yeah. Uh, sadly. Mm. Foreshadowing the uh, lazy get who probably fell off his ship, did he? I can't remember what happened. I, I can't remember, but ev- basically everybody yeah, does, yeah. don't they? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know if Ferdin is specifically referred to, but I'm pretty sure he came a cropper. Yeah. Um, so that, well, in typical fantasy D&D style, they, they get to Lamia, they get to Ram. Ramazaz and they decide to head to the pub. Yeah, they do. I, one thing I did notice about rereading this, it's very much a, a role playing scenario, isn't it? Mm. Right. We uh, we get a magic boat. We yeah. go to this place. We go to the pub. Yeah. And talk to a a barman, a garrulous innkeeper. Yes, exactly. <laughs> who, uh, you know, in the long pantheon of innkeepers in fantasy books, is either an idiot yeah. or you know. Just obnoxious. Well, I, ch- I checked Stormbringer Fourth Edition, and he didn't have a stat block. He doesn't. So, no. That's disappointing. Unlucky. What was he called anyway? Uh, he's got no name. He's this just he's just a redheaded garrulous innkeeper. Of course he is. Um, who runs the pub, heading outwood and coming home safely again? Yeah, quite. Like that. It's all right. That's a good title. Sorry. It would also make quite a good spaceship name. It back to the Ian yeah. and Banks. Yeah, it would. spaceship names. So Elric inquires of the garrulous redheaded innkeeper um, regarding the countries of. Here we go. It's it's pronunciation time yeah, again. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you lead. Us. Are we going Oin and you? Are we going Owen and you? Or you? I, I heard it is Oin. We'll go with Oin. Yeah. I agree. Let's stick with Oin. And this is our first real mention of Oin and you. However, on page one hundred and eighteen, let's have a look. Uh, so he's having this conversation about Oin and you, and uh, the garrulous redheaded innkeeper says, "You think they could be massing for war, my lord?" He raised his eyebrows at Elric before hiding his face in his wine mug. I like that. Wine a wine mug. mug. Yeah. A mug for wine. Yeah, I want, I want wine mugs. Wiping his lips, he shook his red head. They must, then they must war against sparrows. Owen and you are barely nations at all. Their only halfway decent city is Doe's Cam, and that is shared between them being half on one side of the River Ar and half on the other. As for the rest of Owen and you... it's inhabited by peasants who are for the most part so ill-educated and superstition-ridden that they are poverty stricken, not reckon, a potential soldier among them. Do you reckon they're poverty stricken because they're ill educated and superstitious ridden, or they're just ill educated, superstition and poverty stricken? It kind of implies. Yeah, um, yeah. I'd, I'd, you know, in, in terms of a chicken and egg conversation, <laughs> <laughs> the Oin and you <laughs> people are wrong. Sociology <laughs> theory of why Oin and you is superstition ridden. <laughs> Maybe it's just a dump. Maybe it's just a shit. Yeah, it's a crap hole. It's yeah. like Scunthorpe. Yeah, well, and funnily enough, I kind of like the descriptions <laughs> of Oin and you because there's a couple more further on. And what it really, really makes me want to do is run a campaign set in Oin and you. Because, How do you imagine it though? Is it uh... well as as long as it's grimy and shit and low powered and everybody's rubbish? Yeah, it's exactly the type of <laughs> type of game I've ever run. Got the mecca of Doz Cam to go to, haven't you? That's right. You know, yeah. For for all you yeah shopping trips. yeah. So yeah, I and you do do sound a bit rubbish, and you know. That does make me tempted to run a game there. I maybe write some Iron and You fan fiction. I think right. you probably should. Yeah. yeah, with the innkeeper who is actually Moongorn. Ah, yeah. yeah, good point. Yeah, he was just pretending to be a garrulous innkeeper. Yeah, yeah. Of course, we've not come across Moonglum yet, have we? No. But anyway, Diving Tavar presses the landlord on rumours of Yerkoon and his magic mirror, and the innkeeper's quite dismissive of the rumours and and any kind of threat to uh, to Lormir from 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 Iron and you. And he says, "Fear not for Lormir. We can deal easily with any silly attempt to make war from that quarter. But if you'd see for yourselves." You must follow the coast for three days until you come to a great bay. The river Ar runs into the bay, and on the shores of the river lies Doz Cam, a seedy sort of city, particularly for a capital serving two nations. The inhabitants are corrupt, dirty, and disease ridden. But fortunately, they're all so lazy <laughs> and thus afford little trouble, especially if you keep a sword by you. 
That sounds like my kind of place. Sounds yeah. like old, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Yeah. It was, I feel really at home there. Yeah. When you spent an hour in Dawes Cam, you'll realise the impossibility of such folk becoming a menace to anyone else, unless they should get close enough to you to infect you with one of their several plagues. <laughs> He's a wit, isn't he? The yeah. innkeeper. Again, the innkeeper laughed hugely at his own wit. As he sees shaking, he added, or oh, unless you fear their navy. It consists of a dozen or so filthy fishing boats, most of which are so unseaworthy they dare only fish the shallows of the estuary. So, yeah, yeah once again, iron and you sounds fucking ass. I love uh, it. I like this. <laughs> the, the next line there. Elric pushed his wine cup and said, Thank you, landlord. <laughs> <laughs> And then place a Melna bunny and silver piece upon the counter. This will be hard to change. So he's a crafty landlord as well. Yeah. So he could get his own show. Yeah. He, the, he, the, he should be in the TV show, shouldn't yeah. he? This is totally the start of a scenario, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, Talk exactly. to the innkeeper. You could write this down and use it in a game as written. And he gets more so as it goes on, doesn't it? It's yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. But the follow is instructions, which you is do. cool. And, and the instructions do work. So the uh, they take the... Stasolas. Uh, that acronym doesn't work, does it? I'll stop there. Yeah, I won't use that anymore. So they take the, the ship that sails over land and sea. We could just say the ship. The ship. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll go with that. Let's make a pact. Yeah. Yeah. It heads down the, they head down the coast to Doz Cam, but before getting there, Elric and DT decide to scout it out. And the innkeeper was absolutely correct. On one front, Doz Cam looks, in their words, squat, grimy, and poor. <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> I refer back to Scunthorpe. Yeah. But they do spot that there's a fleet of ships anchored there, which is substantially more than they expected, around about 30 ships. So it says um, that they arrive and they're looking, but the ships did not interest them as much as the thing which flashed and glittered above the city, something which had been mounted on huge pillars which supported an axle, which in turn supported a vast circular mirror set in a frame whose workmanship was as plainly non-mortal as that of the ship which had brought the Malnibonians there here. There was no doubt that any who looked upon the mirror of memory and that any who had sailed into the harbour after it had been erected must have had their memory of what they had seen stolen from them instantly. So we know that the um, the ships in the harbour are probably other people's ships and they've sailed in and uh, they've all been bagged by Yakun and Co. And immediately forgotten why they were there. Yeah. So Elric and, and Dive into Val realise that the mirror is set up to capture the memories of invaders from the seaward side. So they decide on a strategy of using the ship. They do. Yep. Uh, to approach from the land side and essentially conduct a smash and grab raid. What could possibly go wrong? Well, very little. Yep. Our old mate King Grom comes back. Oh, oh bloody King Grom. So they're heading land, but the same strange turbulence that killed the sailor back before they departed strikes again, and two more Amerian sailors are dashed to death on the deck. Grom's come for his ship. And Elric entreats him to bugger off, but Grom's not having it. Which uh, I think Grom could be Brian Blessed as well. Gr- Grom could totally be Brian Blessed. Um, and I really, really love this passage, actually, about Grom, because he's basically a petulant grump, and he's not, he, he won't have anything. And he won't have any any reasoned argument, and he's saying, no, I want my ship. No, I want my ship. Give me my ship. And Elric tries to argue back and forth with him, but he, he won't argue, he's, he's, and he just stamps his feet. Like, well, what's, what's, he like gonna do with sh- what's he going to do with the ship? Exactly, but there, there is there is a, a very amusing kind of passage that explains um, his position. And so Elric's saying, he's, he's trying to reason with him. And he's saying, I want my ship. And Elric says, you must kill us to obtain it. Grom says, kill Grom does not kill mortals, he kills nothing. Grom builds, Grom build, brings to life. And Elric says, you've already killed three of our company. Three are dead, King Grom, because you made the land storm. Grom's great brows drew together and he scratched his great head, causing an immense rustling noise to sound. Grom does not kill, he said again. Grom has killed, said Elric reasonably. Three lives lost. Grom grunted. But I want my ship. And this, and this kind of... It goes on for some yeah. time, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> gee, it's, it's that thing of like, oh, forget it, the guy's an idiot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very much so. But eventually uh, DT says, oh, well, maybe we could bargain with him, but Graham doesn't want... He's, Graham ain't into bling. He's not uh, interested he, in anything like that. He's not bothered, he's mostly wearing soil. Yeah, that's right. So Elric, kind of exasperated, is about to despair and say, oh, God, you know, what, what can we do to satisfy you? 
So Grom says, I'm a rough sort of god, if indeed god I am, but I did not mean to kill your comrades. I have an idea. Give me the bodies of the slain. Bury them in my earth. So that's the bargain he strikes. Yeah, his diving tower went for the uh, precious metals, jewels, mm. <laughs> initially before that. That yeah. didn't work. No, he won't have it. And, and you know, Graham does say at one point, I know nothing of purposes and care nothing for you. I want my ship. My brother should not have lent it to you. I'd almost forgotten it, but now that I remember it, I want it. Yeah, because it's nice. <laughs> and that's yeah. that's basically what I do with absolutely everything. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll see a book on eBay, I'll think, oh, I've got that. I completely forgot I had it. I hadn't looked at it for seven years, then I can't find it, and I end up spending 20 quid to replace it. Yeah. And then Get it goes on a shelf, and I forget all about it again. And then buy it again. Yeah. Go, oh, I've got two. Yeah. So I, I kind of identify with Grom on this score. But, you know, Grom does the deal. However... He does point out, you know what, part of this deal is it will no longer sail on land. So Which when is, you get to this lake over here that you were headed to, yeah. tough titty. So that whole passage was completely pointless. Yeah. Absolutely pointless. Yeah. So it was like, right, we've got a boat that goes over land. Yep. Let's talk to the uh, to Grome. Yeah. Uh, he's going to let us use the boat, but not on land. Mm. Brilliant. Yeah. Cheers for that. And it also introduces something of a continuity error. <laughs> Which arises later. Does it? Yeah, it does. I'm glad you pointed out. Yeah, but let's just say this is not the last that we see of the ship. <laughs> on land. Uh, no, no. I, I, think, I, I don't think we hear it talked about on land. Oh, yeah, yeah. Remember, but at the yeah, end, yeah, yeah. it's in, in Maria Harbour. Yeah. And Rakia fucks off to the Isle of Purple Towns, isn't it? It does. Yeah, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah. So, yeah, continuity. God damn it. Come on, Mike. Get yeah. it sorted. Anyway. I, I kind of. So, I mean, the, their plan of. Um, going round by land and then piling up to the city and charging in, is kind of shagged now. I liked the one thing about the, the next chapter of the city and the mirror. Yeah. I like the fact that it was it's from the point of view of Yakun and the oh, yeah. and Captain uh Captain Valerick. Who's about to be eaten. And yeah. Simmeril as well. She yeah. gets a, yeah, it's quite good that. Yeah, it's a nice switch, isn't it? Switch yeah. of perspective. And it's probably easier than to write like a massive loads of passages of fighting and Yeah. <laughs> like, absolutely. Sort of, uh, yeah. Just before we get there, and they realise that the plans are thwarted, thwarted, Divin Tavar looked miserably towards the shining lake. Lake. <laughs> Aye, so much for that scheme. I hesitate to suggest this to you, Elric, but I fear we must resort to sorcery again if we are to stand any chance of achieving our goal. Elric sighed. I fear we must. And of course, speaking of sorcery, we now move on to the following chapter, which again, as you say, is from Yakun's point of view. And as is often the case when we're talking Yakun. He's basically just being a smug pill. He really is. <laughs> from the very outset. He's just basically going, oh, God, I'm so ace. Yeah. So, yeah. But so, he was pleased. His plans went well. Yeah. So, Cimarill doped up to the eyeballs and tireful yeah. listening to all of his gloating <laughs> as, he's, as he's, uh, he's, he's strutting. Yeah, <laughs> he's basically, basically he's strutting is, around in talking a, about how ace everything is. In like a three story crap hole in yeah. Dodd's Cam. Yeah he's, yeah. he's done well for himself. He's got a magic mirror. Yeah. He's in a crap hole. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really love he's it. ran away. Yeah, it says something along the lines of he's real pleased with himself because he's got the best pad in Doz Cam, a three-story building with a with, with, with like with a, panoramic with a pie on the roof. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Panoramic views of the his, Neem his standards have really plummeted yeah, exactly. since he arrived in Ayn. Yeah, yeah. three stories high and the finest in Doz Cam. Yeah. He looked out towards the har- harbour at his splendid captured fleet. And of course it confirms that... Um, that they are, they have been captured and their crews captured by the memories captured by the mirror. Yeah, I can suggest at this point that they've been there some months when he's talking to someone. Yeah, yeah. Which um, I've, I've no idea how long it took the ship that sails over land and sea to get to Lamia. Maybe it does both, but it's really really slow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because every two minutes you have to speak to Grom and Strasser yeah. about. Ugh, yeah. Why don't we just go on like penny farthings? It'd be quicker, yeah. wouldn't it? So it's versatile. It does great MPG. Yeah, but it's really, really slow. Yeah, so it's taken about twelve years. Yeah, yeah. Like it's like my like an Alpeggio two hundred seven. It's like my old Rover. Yeah. So he also lets on that um, he's been summoning demons and he's fed them the souls of all in Oin and you that resisted. And he also confirms, just in order to add incest to his roll call of <laughs> villainous behaviour, that he wants uh, Cimmeril to be his empress. Yeah. And he also brags that he's now opened. The Shared Gate. Yeah, oh, no. Mm, the Shared Gate. But before he gets the chance to kind of elaborate on all that, and 
First, he has to throw a wine jug at a serving girl's head. Yeah, obviously. Because, because the wine's rubbish. Because yeah, he's in, in oil and you... That's right, yeah. yeah. Get out. But then he realises something slightly amiss. Yeah, so, so he spits at her as He well, does. He? Yeah, he gobs at her and lobs a wine jug at her head. And she's a brute-faced, oinish girl. <laughs> Brought him his morning wine. Yeah. So maybe he has... Mm, morning wine. <laughs> maybe he has two or three different types. Yeah. Bring me the morning wine, woman. Well, well, we'll test that out tomorrow morning. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll get some morning wine out before I drop you off at the well, station. Claret's usually the morning wine of choice. Really? It? Claret and chops. Good. Oh. Yeah. Claret chops. Can we throw some liver in there? Yeah, yeah. Liver and onions, yeah. bit of claret. It's awful. Sounds like a perfect Sunday morning to me. Yeah. So he finds Valerick anyway, the traitorous former captain of Cimarill's Guard. And Valeric, kind of exasperated, tells him that there are sorcerous goings-on and daring do afoot in the streets. Strange fireballs are roaming the streets and setting things on fire. And sorcery is keeping their water stuck in their buckets <laughs> when, when they're trying to put the fires out. That's a good spell, isn't it? Yeah, keep water in bucket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what level do you reckon that is? That's, that's a four cracking five. spell. Again, Yakun went to the fence and looked through. There were men in the streets below, fighting his own warriors, but smoke obscured his view. He could not make out the identities of any of the invaders. Ha! Enjoy your petty victory, Yerkun chuckled. For soon the mirror will take away your minds, and you will become my slaves. It is Elric, said Cimmeril quietly. She smiled. Elric comes to take vengeance on you, brother. Yerkun sniggered. Think you? <laughs> Think you? Well, should that be the case, he'll find me gone, for I still have a means of evading him, and he'll find you in a condition which will not please him, though it will cause him considerable anguish. But it's not Elric, it's some crude shaman from the steps to the east of here. He will soon be in my power. Cimmeril too was peering through the fence. Elric, she said, I can see his helm. What? <laughs> How yeah. big is his helm? <laughs> it must be massive. Well, some of the covers, it is pretty massive. Yeah, it's quite tall, isn't it? Yeah. It's so, it's... I just love the way Yakun's written in this, because it's it's actually written as if he was writing some absolute goofball, yeah, yeah. ham, scenery-chewing actor Well, that last bit playing just a reminded villain. me of Ross from Friends. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I just had it in my head. It's like, yeah... Just, he's an idiot, isn't he? Well, I've got a confession to make. I've never, ever seen Friends. So I'll have to take your word for that. I won't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, Coon is an idiot, isn't he? Yeah. And that um, that paragraph goes on and mentions, some, actually refers to something that we were on about in the last episode. Um, and at the head of the attacking Marines could be seen a black dragon helm such as only one Melnibonian wore. War. It was Elric's helm. And Elric's sword that had once belonged to El Orbeck of Malador rose and fell and was bright with blood which glistened in the morning sunshine. So somehow he's managed to keep out of El, El Orbeck's sword when he was kicked overboard. He was, yeah. Well, that's quite handy. It is quite handy. Maybe it was in the scabbard when he was booted over. Did he have it in his hand? I don't know. Mm, not sure, but I think we did comment last one that it must have gone to the bottom of the sea, but no, but, it isn't. But wait. He's still got it. <laughs> yeah. So he's still using the sword of a, it, a hero of law. Plus three magic swords. Mm. So, yeah, Coons, absolutely overwhelmed with despair about all this and uh, Cimarill saying I said he'd come and Yakun's really really having a massive massive paddy so he orders Valeric to turn the mirror upon the melee despite his own men potentially being effective because he don't but he don't care because he's an obed what a splendid irony yeah. I think he describes it as yeah so he's an absolute absolute nobbed. so anyway down in the burning streets we now go back to Elric's perspective, and the fire elementals are fading. Elric and DT see the mirror turning, and they play their trump card, the Amerian veterans. Yeah. And I, I could distinctly remember reading this when I was a teenager and going, ooh, <coughs> and being quite excited by this twist. <laughs> so it turns out the veterans are blind warriors that fight by sound and smell, and there are injured Amerian warriors that lost their sight but are still outrageously good fighters. Valeric is watching this and he's quite admiring of the tactics and the blind Amerian veterans, but Yakun is still completely lo <laughs> <laughs> losing his shit about all this. Blind? Yeah. <laughs> he spoke almost pathetically, refusing <laughs> to understand. Blind? <laughs> yeah. Aye, blind warriors. Yeah, it's wonderful. And he just goes, ah, no, no. <laughs> so he's probably now throwing more wine jugs around at various brute fists. Yeah, so, so the sighted warriors fall back yeah. and allow um, the blind warriors to take over. 
And Yerko, meanwhile, is just is just peering through a curtain. Yeah. <laughs> the goings on. Brave Sir Yaku. Yeah, just uh, just said, Valerick, Valerick, what's going on? Why why isn't this working? <laughs> and the twig, it's blind warriors. And Yerkoon, ah, no, no. <laughs> Yerkoon beat heavily on his captain's back and the man shrank away. <laughs> just like beating him with his fists. Elric is not cunning. He's not cunning. Some powerful demon gives him these ideas. Perhaps, my lord, says Valeric, but these are demons more powerful than... But are there demons more powerful than those who have aided you? No, said Yerkoon, there are none. Oh, that I could summon some of them now. But I've expended my power in opening the shade gate. I should have anticipated... I could not anticipate. Oh, Elric, I shall destroy you when the room blades are mine. So he's just completely losing his shit. It's hilarious. Yeah, and he mentions the room blades for the first time. Yeah, yeah. And then, as if in reply, Yerkoon heard Elric's battle song sounding from the nearby streets, and that song answered the question. Ariok, Ariok, blood and souls for my lord Ariok. Ooh, how often will we hear that? Yeah. Quite a lot. It's not so much a song, really, is it? Not really. Unless he's rapping it. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. If, if you're going to do songs, though, we have learned keep them short, yeah, keep yeah. them simple. I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah, one. that'll do for me. <laughs> That's what I like him. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Coon, he, he knows that he's, he's got no choice now but to pass through the shade gate and get the rune blades, and he confirms that that's his target. He needs the rune blades, allies, supernatural allies, who shall deal easily with Elric, but he needs time. So he tells Valeric, you know what? What we need to do is smash the mirror. And oh, Valerick yeah. says, What? Meanwhile, Elric and his men have cut down the mirror stricken resistors, who have all been caught by the mirror where they weren't. But the victory is short lived, as strange sounds ring out over the city before their minds are flooded by the freed memories when the mirror is smashed. Unfortunately, poor old Valerick comes a cropper himself in this. Yep, he does. And he, uh, sadly for Valerick, instead of being eaten by Yerku, yeah, the turncoat lost his footing again, <laughs> and uh, on the great column and fell with the shards from the mirror to the ground below. Yeah, Elric did not hear him scream and did not hear his body crash first into the rooftop and then into the street where it lay an all broken beneath the mirror. It seems to be partially a Melnibonian warrior's destiny, yeah, they're all, doesn't it? They're Falling all, from a great height and, yeah, they're all and being smashed out. down below. Maybe they've all got vertigo. Yeah. Like, whoa! Yeah. yeah. So the noise, get, noise gets louder, more intense. And now Elric knew. He blocked his ears with his gauntleted, ha- gauntleted hands. The memories in the mirror that were flooding into his mind. The mirror had been smashed and was releasing all the memories it had stolen over the centuries. The aeons, perhaps... Many of these memories were not mortal. Memories, beasts and intelligent creatures which had existed even before Melnibonet and the memories warred for a place in Elric's skull. In the skulls of all the Imerians, in the poor, tortured skulls of the men outside whose pitiful screams could be heard rising from the streets. Yeah. I, I really love... It's, it's quite common in um, in Moorcock, isn't it, that magic stuff is always almost indescribably ancient mm. and almost alien. And even just in a brief description of that, you get a really fantastic kind of um, idea of the world, the young kingdoms being very young, and actually yeah. the world itself and the world at large and sorcery and demons are just not only old but unimaginably old. And this kind of world encompasses so much, and all you ever really see is a snapshot. For such brief books of one hundred and fifty odd pages, they pack in a lot of depth. Yeah. In terms of background, just very, very simply and very quickly, it's great. It goes back to one of those the, the short stories with you Beck in it, yeah. it, where he basically just heads out into raw chaos to, me to bring, yes. bring law to it, and that's how the Young Kingdoms started off, and everything was just like a massive flux. Yeah, it? yeah, it's, and you, you get <clears throat> you get that feel a lot in the Hartnell books as well, don't you, with the technology and the sorcerer yeah. science stuff. Um, but at least the, the yeah, the thing about the Hawkman stuff as well, at least it isn't, as we've said previously, like helicopters and tanks and stuff. It's oh, like good God. completely yeah. mental, yeah, you know, like the throbbing bridge and yeah. loads of crazy ass stuff, which is just like, yeah, you know, it's it's ancient and it's ancient. So it's almost like a yet another kind of 10,000 years yeah. culture which has been lost again. Yeah. It's not like straight after. Yeah, you know, nineteen ninety two is it? Like yeah, some of the 
Well, the war machines are things like um, big, weird, bell-shaped organs that throb and make <laughs> walls fall down a mile away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's all good stuff. And he, um, yeah, I mean, we won't go into detail on Arkham, but even, even um, at the the Camargue, the the weird technology that he has in the watchtowers guarding the Camargue, yeah. he didn't know how they all work. No, and they're also weird because it was yeah. some weird Bulgarian sorcerer, <laughs> sorcerer scientist yeah. who, who came up with them all. But anyway, El- Elric kind of uses his power and his experience of dealing with such um, things as the supernatural and manages to endure it and maintain his, his, his personality and his sanity. But his men aren't so lucky. And more than two-thirds of his men were dead, blind or otherwise. The big bosun was dead, his eyes wide and staring, his lips frozen in a scream his right eye socket raw and bleeding from where he tried to drag his eye from it. All the corpses lay in unnatural positions. All had their eyes open, if they had eyes, and many bore the marks of self-mutilation, while others had vomited, and others had dashed their brains against the wall. He finds DT, fortunately, curled up and babbling to himself, but he's just about all right. But at the end of it, there's only five of them left alive, not including Elric and DT, which is a a bit of a massive swing from um, that seeming victory <laughs> yeah and then he finds Simmeril yeah who's uh, lying on a couch naked with runes painted on it obscene runes obscene runes you, <laughs> you reckon it's like balls, reckon it's like big knobs <laughs> with <laughs> dotted lines coming from them and things Pro- like probably that is, to be yeah fair. boobs um, yeah so she's uh, been put into a well basically a sorceress coma pretty mm. much isn't she mm-hmm. and then uh, they have a brief kind of who I love you, etc. And then he needs to go and find two black swords. Yeah, so she tells him as she comes around that Yakun's passed through the shade gate to obtain the twin rune swords Stormbringer and Mornblade. And that's I think Mornblade was the first time I read about Mornblade, I think, in this mm. book. Yeah. So I think it wasn't even mentioned in any of the other. Well, I think it's mentioned, but it's referred to in Dreaming City when they have the scrap at the end. Is it? Elric has Stormbringer and. and oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yakun has Mornblade. But well, that's yeah. after that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but it's written before. Yeah, yeah this yeah. is the whole confusion. It's yeah. written 10 years before this. Yeah. Um, yeah. At this point, Ariok turns up in handsome youth mode. And, he does. and we get a, a fairly standard, or what will become standard, Ariok Elric conversation. Yeah. Which is, uh, you know, go get the swords, Elric. It's your destiny. And Elric said, oh, but I don't want to. And Elric's like, oh, yeah, but destiny, mate. Yeah. You got to. He's going, oh, it'd be ace. Yeah, do it for Simmeril. It'll be rubbish yeah. if you don't. And he's like, oh, all right, I will. So Elric sends DT, Simmeril, and the survivors home and enters the smelly shade gate. He does. Now, it doesn't actually specifically mention there, I don't think, that he sends DT, Simmeril, and the survivors home. On the ship that sails, no longer over land, but still on water. <laughs> yeah, um, which is supposedly landlocked in a lake, but he must have because it's there at the end. Yeah, I think he did. I yeah. think he must have. They must. They must have figured out something. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they dragged it. Yeah, <laughs> they built some wheels or something. And you kind of learn a bit about the uh, about the gods on the his conversation. The uh, yep. You know, learn a bit about. Ariok and the gods, so Elric's going, uh, you are cryptic, my lord Ariok. And uh, his reply is basically, that is a way of the lord of the higher wor- worlds. Hurry, even I cannot c- keep the shade gate open. So he's just like, yeah, we are a bit cryptic and a bit annoying, really. Mm. And uh, yeah, so he goes into the shade gate, into book three. Yep. Uh, and now there is no turning back at all. Elric's destiny has been forged. And fixed as surely as the hell swords were forged and fixed eons before. Yeah. Not my words. No. The words of book three. Yeah. So it goes through the shared gate and it's dark and briny. Yeah. It's... And there's, there's a good page which is describing <laughs> how dark and briny it is. It is very and, uh, dark. And it's very dead and he, he surmises that perhaps it's a place which maybe law and chaos warred over. And uh, and that was the end result, turning it into that complete and utter, uh, an utter shit hole. Yeah. yeah. Um, strange then that he happens upon a fella pretty quickly. He does. Kind of pretty much within five minutes. Yeah. Um, and it turns out to be well, no way. It's Rakia the Red Archer, warrior it, priest it of Foom. It certainly is. Yeah. Are you going for Foom? Fo- well, I don't know. What do you think? P H U M. Foom. Foom. Poom. It probably is. But I always had it as Pum. <laughs> I don't know Pume. what. It's Pume, not. Foom. Well, we'll just have to agree. Just what call we're going him Rakia. Of... Just call him Rakia the Red yeah, Archer. Yeah. Let's not talk about Foom Poom. No. 
So this is a staple of Mocock, isn't it? And 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 we we talked about it in the birthday episode with Phil. It's kind of a Robert E. Howard thing as well, which is I'm in a strange place. There's danger afoot. Oh look, here's this dude. How in do you do? Bush. Let's adventure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I must say that's that's always been my approach in gaming. Let's not worry about massive backstories. All right, I'll I'll fall out of a bush. Let's yeah. adventure. Here he is. Yeah. Uh, I you know I'm hanging around. Let's yeah. join together. Yeah. And it's, it, it happens in, in just about every book. It happened in um, The Tower of the Elephant. It, sorry, that's the Robert E. Howard book. It, it happens... We've not quite got to it in Hawkmoon yet because he's not met Aladdin or um, Daverk. Yeah. But it tends to be a staple. I mean, it even happens with Jerry Carnell in Corum, doesn't it? Which we'll get to because we're going to do that next. We, we will. Yeah. He's just kind of that's there. Too, it's like, all right, I'm Jerry. Yeah. Let's go. Let's party. So there's this kind of thing... In Moorcock, and I think it's now something of a staple in certain types of fantasy. And it's like, hello, I am Terry, the chaos struck law yeah. badger. All right, I'm Elric. What are you doing? It's, it's shit. I'm escaping a chaos god. Well, let's party. Yeah, exactly. Going, oh, well, it could, could be a lot worse, couldn't it? Let's yeah. just hang out. Yeah. I think he's, there's a couple of short stories the same, aren't they? Von, one of the Von Becks turns up in one of the short stories or right. every, pretty much every week. Yeah. Yeah. Reynard or Bernard von Beck or something. Yeah. And they go, yeah, yeah. Uh, we seem a reasonable cove. Mm. And he's the Red Archer for a reason. Mm-hmm. Everything he wears is red. Yep. You know, the priests of Foom or yep. Pume uh, just pick a colour and mm. just dress like that. He's even got a red handkerchief. Yeah. He's, he's just part of their style. He's just got, it's got everything he's yeah. red. And yeah. his bow is red as well. Yeah. He's styling, he's profiling. Yeah. Um, we found out that he refused to serve his chaos patron because he did. Uh, the warrior priests of Poom, Foom, yeah. um, actually serve lords of chaos. So he got banished here. What a fortunate piece of happenstance! It was quite lucky, wasn't it? Yeah. So they agree not to fight anywhere, um, and then we get to, we have to get quite a nice description of Rakia. You do, and it goes thus: "I am Rakia," said the man, called the Red Archer. For as you see, I affect scarlet dress. It's a habit of the warrior priests of Foom to choose but a single colour to wear. It's the only loyalty to tradition I still possess. If only Divin Tarkan had taken that same approach to tradition. He had on a scarlet jerkin, scarlet breeks, scarlet shoes, a scarlet cap with a scarlet feather in it. His bow was scarlet, the pommel of his sword glowed ruby red. His face, which was aquiline and gaunt, as if carved from a fleshless bone, was weather-beaten, and that was brown. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, not that's a really strange sentence. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was brown. Yeah, yeah, he was tall and he was thin, but muscles rippled on his arms and torso. There was irony in his eyes and something of a smile upon his thin lips, though the face showed that it had been through much experience, little of it pleasant. One and, thing I will just just touch on there: uh, breeks, breeks. What the hell are breeks? That's a good question. I it know. is, and he and most mocap characters wear breeks. I've just always assumed that the like. Jogging pants. You reckon? Yeah. Pair of joggers. Yeah. So, you know... Scarlet joggers. You know, at the moment, that unfortunate um, fashion for kind of slate grey jogging pants and sweatshirts has come back into fashion. Yeah, yeah. In in certain areas. My 14-year-old son is quite into those. God only knows why that's become a thing again. (laughs) Um, But, yeah, they look like grey breeks to me. You think? Yeah. Could be wrong. Yeah. I'm not suggesting Rakia wears jogging pants. I suppose what I really just mean is their trousers. Or maybe the tights. I don't know. Mm. Well, maybe uh, yeah, we need to look, look into that. Folks on Twitter, yeah. if anybody can save us from the ridiculously complex task of Googling breeks, yeah. please let us know what the fuck a breek is. So th- there again, yeah, we, we have the mock-up tradition of uh, describing the character through the article of dress. Yeah, he does the same with Count Brass. He does doesn't whatever, he? Yeah, he brass. wore he wore brass trousers. brass pants. Yeah, yeah brass, brass breeks, shoes. Probably. He had brass <laughs> hearing aids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the Red Archer. Well, it Look, turns out. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, that was it. I was just saying. At least he picks red. Could yeah. be worse. Could be the yeah. brown Archer would yeah. have been a bit rubbish, wouldn't it? Yeah. And it turns out Racky has no idea of the of what Elric's after, which of course we know now is the the pulsing cavern. He's looking for the Pulsing Cavern. He is. And the two black swords. And Rakia ain't heard of the Pulsing Cavern. And frankly, he ain't heard of uh, the swords either. 
and Eric explains, the swords are legendary. Many books make some small reference to them, almost always mysterious. There's said to be one term which records the history of the swords and all who have used them, and all who will use them in the future. A timeless book which contains all time. Some call it the Chronicle of the Black Sword, and in it, it is said, men may read their whole destinies. Mm. Makes it sound like a really kind of cool read. Does, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Also makes it slightly more disappointing that the Chronicle of the Black Sword by Hawkwind is so <laughs> not quite as epic. Yeah. And that's always the beginning bit, isn't it? The Chronicle of the Black Sword pieces are always yeah. the beginning of all the stories. That's right, yeah. So, anyway, they discuss the nature of the plane they find themselves in. Is it a, a sphere within a, a universe of rock? Or is it a rock in a universe of spheres? Yeah. You know, is it a yeah. teacup? And then we get the first mention of the city of Tanalon. Yeah, I had that as which well. Which will be the first of many. And of course, I think, because this isn't written... This is the first chronological story, but was written 11 years and several years after a lot of the short stories. Rakia the Red Archer is in the quest for Tanalon, but he's also in one of the other stories, isn't he? He's in, he's in uh, the Nadsakor City of Beggars one. He's in the one where they actually defend Tanalon, isn't he? Against the... Oh, yeah. The, is that called to save Tanalon or something? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think he's, in that, he's, he's in the quest for Tanalon as well. Yeah, Elric lives in Tanalon for a bit, doesn't he? He does. Indeed, yeah. he does. Didn't like it. No, uh, too boring true. for him. Yeah, yeah. So Elric remarks on uh, Rakia's philosophizing at this point when they're talking about Tanalon. Rakia laughed. It's such thinking that weakened my loyalty to chaos and led me to this pass. I've heard there's a city called Tanalon which may sometimes be found on the shifting shores of the Cyan Desert. If I ever return to our world, comrade Elric. I shall seek that city, for I've heard that peace may be found there. That such debates as the nature of truth are considered meaningless. That men are consent merely to exist in Tanalon. I envy those who dwell in Tanalon, said Elric. Rakia sniffed. Aye, but it would probably prove a disappointment if found. Legends are left, best left as legends, and attempts to make them real are rarely successful. Come, yonder lies Amiron. And that, sad to say, is more typical of most cities one comes across on any plane. Yeah, Amiron's the anti Tanalon, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Um, and Amiron is, is a, got a, several more quite cool descriptions that make me want to write about it or run a game there, because once again, it's rubbish. Yeah, a mixture <laughs> and of grim. architectural styles, some familiar, some most alien. Yeah. Um, others, some merely piles of rock. With a jagged opening at one end for a door. Mm. So basically, it, Amaroon. Um, sorry, that's how I'm pronouncing it. That's completely wrong. Yeah, that's why I paused Am- when I was reading it because I was thinking, that's not right, is it? No, no. I'm sure it's Amaroon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's Amir- Amiron. 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 That's sounds- Amiron. Amiron. Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, yeah, so Amiron is basically, seems to be inhabited by lots of people who have been lobbed there by yeah. various chaos gods yeah. and other people of. Ill repute, yeah, and uh, they trade with demons occasionally. Yeah, so, yeah it's a great setting. Yeah, a bit of a crap hole. Yeah, I think there's there was one game written set in there in a mirror. Right. Yeah, I've got it somewhere. Right. Never okay. Played it. Probably terrible. Yeah. Right. Let's just brief briefly pause while we get our uh, second half beer lined up. Back in a sec. We're back, and we have Paradise City. We do. Uh, what is it? Coral well, it's definitely Mosaic. A nice label. It is. But it doesn't actually say what it is. So I guess we just have to open it up and crack in and see what it's happens. It's a very good, uh, very good artwork there. Yeah, it's lovely. Ooh, like 6.8. It. Ooh. Yeah. Reference. Probably good that it's a, a Diddy can. Right. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. As soon as it is only uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Oh, my morning, joke. Our morning beer. <laughs> morning beer. We've had our chops. Mm. We've had a claret. Now it's on to beer, as God intended. Ooh. Ooh. Is that a new matron or a new... Oh, have a go. It's... A lo- it's unusual. It's... Kind of got... 
a hint of oh pineapple. Oh my god, that's absolutely mental. As if somebody tried to approximate what pineapple tastes like and got it slightly wrong. I don't even think it's pineapple, it's more sprouty. Yeah, it, it, it seems to me like if you created medicine for a child and said, <laughs> don't worry, love, it tastes a pineapple, and then they tried it, this is what it would taste like. <laughs> that is That is... A challenging drink, though, yeah, isn't it? It is. This, this is what I think I'm going to take my time over this one. Yeah, right. possibly. Pour In it order out. to distract myself from this beer, <laughs> let's crack on. <laughs> so, uh, oh, by the way, uh, for anybody that's uh, that's interested, Tanalon is actually in Hull. It's called the Inkerman Tavern. Is it? So there we go. Excellent. Anyway, back to you. See, I've even written it as Amarine. Yeah, in, in, in my notes, in, not Amiron. <laughs> so we know Amarine is a dump where. Inhabitants are kind of dumped from all over the place, from all sorts of times and places, and the uh, the geography and yeah, no, the, ge- <laughs> the geography and the uh, the architecture is chaotic and all over the place, and people form into communities to trade with demons, the trade babies, souls, yeah, it's pretty whatever, un- it's pretty unpleasant. And we have the traditional Moorcock every few pages have something that happens action yep. scene yep so we have a an action scene with uh, three chaos larkers yeah and I, when i was reading it, i was like right there's there's two men that have partially transformed into pigs who both seem to think they're the same pig and all they say is pig is that right i think so yeah because there's pig there's pig and there's two of them yeah there's snakes and then there's it was like thing. the body of a youth with about 15 snakes sprouting out of his neck. Yeah. And this thing, which is an absolute mess of stuff and multiple limbs and yeah. tentacles and God knows what else. So they have a confrontation with these things and pig only says pig, pig. Yeah. And snakes only says snakes. And thing just keeps saying thing, thing. Yeah. So Elric and Raki are... Well, Elric finds himself musing on the nature of beings bound to chaos and wondering whether his destiny lies in the same place. As you would. Yeah. As you're about to And assumes that these poor things were, were, you know, once real people who succumbed to chaos and they end up having a big fight. And Raki dispatches one of the pigs with his bow and gets into it with the other one, chops a few of the snakes, snakes off. And meanwhile, Elric's fighting this thing, which keeps shouting thing at him yeah. as he's fighting him. So Elric just starts shouting, Elric, <laughs> Elric, um, in order to kind of, you know, get in on the act. And he's a very good writer, but sometimes the dialogue in this particular <laughs> no, section no, for me... Not the greatest dialogue. No, no. That said, I remember a long, long time ago running a game of uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, and because I'm lazy, I used Pig... And thing in a Warhammer Fantasy roleplay game, and, and I took great pleasure in having Pig shout Pig all the way through the fight, and yeah. uh, I thought it was quite entertaining. I think it, I think they found it quite unsettling, so yeah. it did the trick. I think if you were running Warhammer, with you like fighting with pasties or something? <laughs> it was really low powered, <laughs> or like sharpened pencils. Uh, well, that that party was. I think there was uh, one of them was a grave digger. One of them was a charcoal burner, and the other one was um, uh, an acolyte at a temple, and they were all like seventeen. And the the entire game revolved around them transporting a a, a cartload of sausages <laughs> from from Heideldorf back to. Uh, they, had, they had to go to Heideldorf, buy a load of sausages, and get them back in time for Sigma Fest. And that's just like high f- fantasy. It's, 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 it's my just kind of fantasy. That's yeah. the, it's the kind of fantasy I love. And uh, at one point they actually got ambushed by bandits and they managed to strike a bargain with the bandits so the bandits only took half the sausages. Brilliant. And then and then got away with it yeah. through social skills. <laughs> yeah. It's social skills. Through it's hilarious. Sausages. And they're all hardcore Warhammer Fantasy Battle players and Warhammer 40,000 players. So that they actually found it really amusing and entertaining <laughs> that they were all too <laughs> shit to have a fight with anything. So they used... All of every single kind of dodge and so anyway, we digress. Yeah, we really do. Yeah. We really do digress quite badly. So anyway, Elric's fighting chaos thing, and it's yelling thing at him as he's chopping off numerous arms, tentacles, and extremities, and he's shouting Elric back at it. And while he's shouting Elric back at it, this is Yerkun's work," said Elric. Without a doubt, he's heard that I've followed him and seeks to stop us with his demon allies. He gritted his teeth and spoke through them. Unless one of these things is Yerkun himself. Are you my cousin Yakun? Thing? <laughs> Thing, the voice was almost pathetic. The weapons waved and clashed, but they no longer darted so fiercely at Elric. Or are you some other old familiar friend? Thing. 
Elric stabbed again and again into the mass. Thick, reeking blood spurted and fell upon his armour. Elric could not understand why it had become so easy to take the attack to the demon. Now, shouted a voice from above Elric's head. Quickly! Elric glanced up and saw a red face, a white beard, a waving arm. Don't look at me, you fool. Now, strike! And Elric put his two hands above his sword hilt and drove the blade deep into the shapeless creature which moaned and wept and said in a small whisper, Frank, before it moaned. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, for, for, for those who perhaps um, are not fully aware, and I'll, I'll look forward to exp- trying to explain this one to Hussein <laughs> when we do first two of the final programme. Of course, Frank is basically Yer Coon. Yeah, in Jerry Cornelius' world. It and Jerry Cornelius is essentially Elric. So the final programme is a retelling in some ways of the Dreaming City. So we have this um, nice little piece of intertextuality within Mocock, because of course by the 70s it's starting to draw all these threads together a little bit yeah. more literally and directly. Because he wrote the Dreaming City in 61, he wrote the final programme in 1967, and now here in 1972... Is just starting to litter his works with all of these things that will eventually, I suppose, come to a head in the quest for Tanalon. Um, <laughs> in a not particularly satisfactory <laughs> way. And, point various, other and various other things yeah. as he as he revises that as he goes yeah. along. But I do remember reading that when I first read this. I was like, no way! Yeah, <laughs> no no way, way, Frank. Yeah, oh my God. No but it way. also, you know, so if you think, so Frank's become a gibbering nightmare of yeah. a mess. yeah. Yeah, the ultimate fate of Yakun, which I won't say, yeah. but it, it doesn't end well for him either, does no. it really? No, it doesn't. So yeah, that's that's a nice little uh, reference. There's some more references though, isn't there, that follows straight away. So yeah, so new in. <laughs> yeah, so so he's, this red faced white bearded guy turns out to be Neon Nuin Nyun. Anyway, Neon. I'm, I'm going for Nuin. Nuin. Yeah. But, but, because it's, you know... Yeah, okay. New in, who knew all? He does. Yeah. Oh, not so much. Not so much anymore. So Elric says to... Uh, it said, Frank, said Elric, frowning. Was that a name, do you think? Its name, perhaps? Perhaps, said old Neon. Perhaps. Poor creature. But still. It's dead now. And then they move on. And it turns out that Neon... He tells them where to head, because he knows who Elric is, and he knows his destiny. But he once does. he says that, he forgets. Yeah, which is handy. Yeah. And then he tells them where they need to go... But then forgets. Yeah. And then he forgets who they are. Yeah. And he capers off. Yeah. Because he's doomed to be there. Because he was there, um, sent there by Orland of the Staff. He was, yes. Orland of the Staff ah. uh, for Hawkmoon people. Yeah. Uh, Orland Fank. Orland the, Fank. The Orkney Isles, yeah. Yeah. Dude who appears in various books. So we haven't got that far in our Hawkmoon episode yet, but here, here we have a, a reference again in Elric in this weird. Playing our shithole of um, Orland Fank, Orland of the Rune Staff from Hawkmoon. Who seems to have um, tricked this uh, bearded, red faced gentleman into yeah. uh, an adventure, doesn't yeah. he? And then basically is taking his memory away. Yeah. Every. Yeah, so he's, he's kind of doomed to be there until he doesn't know what he did know. Yeah. But Rakia muses that, or is it Elric, says, um, but what if he forgets that he's supposed to leave? Yeah, exactly. Which mm. I think is probably the ultimate irony, but not yeah. so good for you know all end of the staff. No, certainly not. But yeah, and then uh, off he capers. Rakia says, "I think perhaps I envy Neon alone of all the inhabitants of this desolate place." I pity him," said Elric. "Why so?" It occurs to me that when he's forgotten everything, he may well forget he's allowed to leave Amiron. Rakia laughed and slapped the albino upon his black armored back. "You are a gloomy comrade, friend Elric." Are all your thoughts so hopeless? They tend to they tend in that direction, I fear," said Elric with a shadow of a smile, <laughs> which is uh, a, a little piece of self awareness, yeah, and, yeah, and, which... and, and almost a joke <laughs> from Elric, which you don't get That's very often. Melbourne and black humour. <laughs> yeah, it's not for everyone. Yeah. So, following Nayan's instructions, Rakia and Elric find a monument in a stinking marsh, as you do, and Elric's weakening now from his exertions. It's an eagle, isn't it? If that's up on the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably a Roman thing. Yeah. And Rakia decides to uh, pass the time testing each footstep with his unstrung, unstrung bow stave. He follows behind, whistling a small, complicated tune as he goes. 
Another of his race have rec- would have recognised the tune as the song of the son of the hero of the high hell who is about to sacrifice his <laughs> life. A popular melody in Foom, particularly amongst the cast of the warrior priest. Mm. Yeah. A bit of foreshadowing, perhaps. <laughs> bit of foreshadowing, perhaps. So we get a bit of a distraction as Elric, Elric nearly sinks in the swamp. Yeah. And I think that's entirely just an excuse for Rekia to save him so that yeah. Elric's got that obligation to him. You know, I suppose if you're in a swamp and you're in a fantasy story or even an adventure story, you've got to have somebody almost sink. Somebody's going to fall in, Yeah, and, yeah. Get, and get saved. So Elric is now indebted to the Red Archer, but they reach the monument, they enter to find the tunnel, a wet, fleshy tunnel mm. with a pulsing aperture. <laughs> <laughs> and despite being knackered, Elric eyes the aperture and decides to dive on through and finds the pulsing cavern where the two swords are suspended in the air and Yakun stands below and says, No! This as he spots a bit again, doesn't he? Yeah. He, you know, he, sh- he should know by now, shouldn't he, really? <laughs> Damn you! Yeah. Rakia fitted an arrow to his bow. He drew the string back to his shoulder, sighting along the narrow... So, <laughs> sighting along the arrow at Prince Yakun. If you must die, Elric, tell me. Slay him! said Elric. And Rakia released the string. But the arrow moved very slowly through the air and then hung halfway between the archer and his intended target. Yakun turned a ghastly grin on his face. Mortal weapons are useless here, he said. So Yakun's got his get out of jail free card because yep. only the black swords will work in the pulsing cavern. Obviously. So Elric rules. says, you know what, Rakia, you better make yourself scarce. Go back through the aperture. It's down it's a throwdown now yeah. between me and Yakun. <sighs> and this fight it's very similar to the one at the end of the Dreaming City. It is it? very similar. With them just maybe with a little bit more detail, but I think really the difference with this one is Elric's fighting Yakun, but he's also fighting Stormbringer from for control. Yeah. And while Yakun gives himself entirely to Mornblood because he's a power hungry, a half crazed loon, Elric's fighting Stormbringer for control. But Stormbringer kind of lets him know what's in it for him. He realises that He's, he's now all of a sudden got vitality. He realises that it will free him from his reliance on drugs. Yeah. He realises that he has almost unbridled power at his fingertips, this massively powerful weapon. But he also realises, because Stormbringer kind of communicates it to him, that there is a cost, and that cost is people to fall on his sword yeah, feed Stormbringer. So basically he chooses the, a life of violence, pretty much. Yeah, and I, I think it's there's a couple of things going on there. One, one is Elric is um, uh, vitalised by the potential power of the sword, but also Elric's playing a short game, whereas yeah. Stormbringer's playing the long game. Yeah, yeah. So Stormbringer, he fights for control of Stormbringer. He tells Stormbringer, I'm not going to kill Yakun. Yeah. You're not going to have his soul. And Stormbringer kind of thinks, you know what, but he's accepted the symbiosis. Yeah. So I'm in this for the long haul. Yeah. So Stormbringer kind of relaxes, knowing that at times Elric will relax that posture and relax his guard. And Stormbringer <laughs> well, you will, know it, he's off. Yeah, and Stormbringer <laughs> oh, wow. will uh, will take his, his fill. And um, oh, oh, by crikey, <laughs> doesn't that happen quite often? Yeah, doesn't that seem to be a poor choice? <laughs> yeah. So the sword acquiesces because it's played in the long game. And once that happens, they start to fight as a like a unified entity, and and essentially Yakun is defeated. Mornblade's gone. Yakun goes back to his standard position, <laughs> a snivelling, yeah, yeah, snivelling wretch, begging for his life. At which point, Elric, Elric's won, and again for the second time we see Elric win over Yakun, lose all of his vengefulness, yeah. lose all of his wrath, become very zen. Become Zen, become contemplative, become quite liberal in yeah, his yeah. approach to what he's going to do, and he essentially tells Yakun, "You know what? All I want is Simmeril back, and uh, and and you can live." Yakun points out at this point that um, the only way they can get out of the pulsing cavern is uh, it's it's a bit of a throwaway. This there's no real brilliant explanation given no. as to why they can't leave the pulsing cavern. Because he manages to get Rakir to come back in through the orifice. He can go one way, can't he? Ah, uh, it's a, it's a yeah. one way orifice. It's a one way orifice. The worst yeah. kind of orifice. Aperture orifice, yeah. yeah. So he just, he, he realises that he's got to call Ariok. So he summons Ariok again. 
And this time Ariok turns up as a weird bubbling cloud of, unpleasant. of, of unpleasantness, yeah. which freaks the fuck out of Rakia. And of course, Ariok takes one look at Rakia and says, Ah, well, he's not going with you. Yeah. He's ours. But Elric, once again, does the right thing. And he gets shirty with Ariok to get Rakia off the hook. And Ariok does the deed and transports them to the throne room in Maria. So they're back in Maria. Yeah. Yeah, can rev- revive Cimarron. Imria has a week-long celebration. They do. Everybody goes, Elric's all right, actually. Yeah. We like him. Everybody goes, oh, yeah, that Elric. <laughs> We've always liked him. What a guy. Yeah. But essentially, I think it's just all about the fact that they want a party. Yeah. I'm mildly disappointed that they didn't describe any kind of disgusting debauchery or cannibalism at this party. Yeah, yeah, it was all probably just like, you know, a couple of volivants and some sausage rolls. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, and yeah, Coon spends his time... Skulking in the corner, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. He spends his time sitting on the, the throne steps, sulking. There were celebrations in Melnibane for a week. Now almost all the ships and men and dragons were home, and Elric was home, having proved his right to rule so well that all of his strange quirks of character. This mercy Which I think is... we need we need to actually just just you know, talk about that a bit. Mm. You know, he's you know, he's ruled so well by how, how the Mel and Bonians yeah. are a bit thick, aren't they? Really? Well, I, th- I think they all th- pretty much think he's a wanker, don't they? So when they're talking about his strange works, quirks of character, like the Mercy, all of a sudden are accepted by the populace. Yeah, they're a bit fickle, aren't they? Really? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just kind of the, the fact that he goes out on a mission to take down Yakun and Co- does it. Yeah, it comes back with a massive hell sword. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe that's what gets them all. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'd do a disservice to him, but yeah. I still think they're idiots. Because, you know, yeah, yeah, Cooney's like the the quintessential twisted Melnibonian. And Elric goes yeah. after him and brings him back on yeah. his knees. Yeah, I suppose. That's maybe enough to get him some yeah. some respect. So in the throne room, there's a ball. And it's the most lavish ball any of the courtiers had ever known. Mm-hmm. Elric danced with Cimarill, taking a full part in the activities. He's dancing now. Yeah. Only Yakun did not dance, preferring to remain in a quiet corner below the gallery of the music slaves, ignored by the guests. Rakia the Red Archer danced with several, Mel- several Melnibonian ladies and made assignations with all of them, for he was a hero now in Melnibonair. Dive into our dance too, though his eyes were often brooding when they fell upon Prince Yakun. So that doesn't sound like a, an Imerian party, no, really. It's, it seems a bit tame, all, though. Yeah, all, all seems a bit... Um, Nobody's been sacrificed, you know. No one's been sacrificed. No one's been um, gradually dismantled by Dr. Jest and fed to somebody. No. Nobody's yeah. yeah. Nobody's eaten any of the slaves. Yeah. yeah. So ultimately a bit of a dry party, really. Yeah, so El- Elric probably feels like he's, uh, he's got one over on everybody because yeah. they're actually having quite a civilised party. Yeah, yeah. And he's dancing. Yeah, and if Ricky is there and he's not going... Oh, sweet God, get <laughs> me the fuck the, out of here. This is the, horrendous. What the hell is going on here? Yeah, what, what seven hells is this? Um, it must all be a little bit lame. Yeah. So that's a bit disappointing. And then what's even more disappointing, I suppose, although predictable, is uh, Elric decides he wants a gap year. Yeah, he's uh, he's you know he's a bit shagged out after yeah. his uh, overland overseas session. Yeah. You know, in you. Yeah. He is decides he, he wants a gap year. And he says to Cimarell, oh, I need to be an empress in place while I'm gone. Yeah. And she goes, oh, no, not for me. Is... What, for whatever reason, he turns him down. Yeah. And then, Being an empress. And then she, so then he says, oh, well, maybe maybe diving to that. And she says, oh, no, no, diving won't be up for that. And then he says, well, she says, how about Megan Colin? And he's like, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> and he looks around and goes, oh, yeah, Coon then. <laughs> yeah. At which point she's like, no, yeah, it's no, got, it's got a list I'll of, do like, it. What she should say is, no, no, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, got Seriously, a list of three I'll do four it. people. Yeah. Uh, so and so, what about Tanglebone? Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. he, he's, no, he won't be able to do it. What about Jeff? Yeah. No. Dr. Jess? No. Yeah. Yaku. Yeah. Yeah, he gets right like, to the bottom. Like, right, I need someone to take over this podcast. Uh, Lars, no, you don't want to do it. <laughs> Phil, no, Phil won't want to do it. Right, I'll go and knock some tramp out <laughs> in the bus stop <laughs> and drag him in. Uh, no, he don't want to do it either. Right, in that case, it will be my mortal enemy <laughs> yeah. who's tried to kill me 47 times. And, uh, Proved and what- himself to be a pretty poor ruler yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. Phil's brother, who <laughs> wants to shag her, 
<laughs> and has tried to kill me 47 times. Yeah. Perfect he's, choice. He, he seems all right. Yeah, perfect choice. Thoroughly splendid man. Yeah. Because he'll learn from his experience. Because when, you know, when we're looking at Yakun's character, he is a learner, isn't he? Yeah. He's, he adapts, he kind of evolves. Or yeah. is he just a one-man idiot? Yeah. So he's going to be on the throne going... <laughs> Yeah, Coon, do you want to be on the throne for a year? <laughs> do yeah. I? Yeah. I'm definitely not going to do anything dodgy. Yeah. So I, I don't think we're giving really, I don't think we're really providing any spoilers when we say it doesn't quite go according to plan. No. 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 But, you know, it's a couple of things. Bailrick's really convinced, isn't he, that he's well in charge of Stormbringer. Mm-hmm. He's on this. He's got this shit sorted. Yeah. He's going to go out there, learn some stuff from the Young Kingdoms, yep. come back and. and Melna Bonnie will be a force for good. That's right. At that point, Simmeral goes, what for good? What are you on about? Yeah. Why would you do that? Yeah. And, and of course, he doesn't really believe what he's saying because he says, oh, yeah, it's fine. I've got Stormbringer under control. Yeah. He says, oh, yeah, I love you, Simmeral. Everything will be great. Everything will be fine. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, Coon, no problem. Everything will be groovy. And then the chapter ends with, now Elric had told three lies. Yeah. The first concerned his, his cousin Yakun, the second concerned the Black Sword, and the third concerned Cimmeril. And upon those three lies was Elric's destiny to be built, for it is only about things which concern us most profoundly that we lie clearly and with profound conviction. So that suggests that Elric didn't really believe what he was saying either. No, so he just he... wanted his gap here. So yeah, he just really wanted to see the world. Yeah. So the entire basis of Elric's problem and with destiny and everything else, his original destiny was just to do his job and be a Melnibonian. Be an emperor. Be an emperor. <laughs> yeah, hang on. Let me, Lord is pulling faces at this beer. Let me just double check. This beer is, it's like, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking bad news. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I need something else to take the taste yeah, away. Okay. Let's take our minds off it by thinking what a twat Elric is. Yeah. So he's completely avoided all of his responsibilities yep. and just continually lies to himself in order to justify his flights of fantasy. So not only he is he knows s- Yakun's not going to do the do. Well, if he, he knows, doesn't, he's an idiot, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he knows Cimmeril is Cimmeril is warning him constantly that he's being an idiot. Yeah, but he's like, oh, it'll be fine. Yeah. And he knows that his relationship with Stormbringer. Really, is a means to an end, and he's well, I think he's, he's put pro- his foot right in it. You'd expect him to do a bit of research, wouldn't he? He's like, Oh, Stormbringer, you say, I'll just have a look in one of my grimoires. <laughs> yeah. Stormbringer, yeah. Oh, it steals people's souls, yeah. it's the manifestation, the manifestation of evil, yeah. blah 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 blah. Sounds all right, yeah. I'll check your coon's library, see if he's got a copy of Chronicle <laughs> of the Black Sword. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, he's, he's kind of set himself up, but it, it doesn't matter because we get the epilogue and there he is in Menai in the Purple Towns with Raki the Red Archer and King, Strath- King Strasher's lovely ship is there as well. Yeah, how? So, we don't know. How continuity error or dragged it there. That might be a good fly. Yeah. So Raki says that he seeks peace and mythic Tanalon with a certain amount of self-mockery. Yeah. So he's decided that what he said earlier about not wanting to, you know, Find out whether legends are true or not. He's decided to abandon that. He's going to go and find. Going to go and find. Going to go for it anyway. Yeah. Elric is now dressed in simple costume that marked any soldier of fortune of the young kingdoms. He looked fit and relaxed. He smiled into the sun. Exactly. He's he's an happy man, isn't he? You know. The only remarkable thing about his garb was the great black rune sword at his side, which probably stands out a bit. To be fair. Yeah. Since he'd done the sword, he'd needed no drugs at all to sustain him. So he knows that everything's going to be a shit show, but he's playing that short game. He wants to be out and about, he wants to be in the sunshine, and more importantly, he wants to be in pubs in the he Purple does. Towns. Yeah, yeah, he's, that's all it was. It's he's all, all about the pubs. It's all about the pub crawl around the Purple Towns. Yeah. Well, meet Smeorg and Baldhead. Yeah. Hang out with him for a bit. Yeah. With hilarious adventures. Yeah. Unfortunately, for Rakia, they will look out of the harbour and see the... Uh, the ship which sails over land and sea uh, is actually sinking because King Strash is taking it back. So yeah. Ricky is going to have to get so some that, other way of getting So there. that MacGuffin's gone. Yeah. And Alex says, the elementals are friends at least, but I fear their power wanes as the power of Malnibane wanes. For all that we of the Dragon Isle are considered evil by the folk of the Young Kingdoms, we share much in common with the spirits of earth, air, fire and water. Rakia said, I envy you these friends, Elric. You may trust them. Aye. Rakia looked at the rune sword hanging on Elric's hip, but you would be wise to trust nothing else, he added. 
Eldrick laughed. Fear not for me, Rakia, for I am my own master, for a year at least, and I am the master of this sword now. The sword seemed to stare at his side, and he took firm hold of its grip, and slapped Rakia on the back, and he laughed and shook his white hair so that it drifted in the air, and lifted his strange red eyes to the sky, and he said, I shall be a new man when I return to Melnibonair. And thus ends book three of Elric of Melnibonair. And thus, we actually get to the end of a novel we on do. Breakfast in the Ruins podcast. <coughs> we do. Uh, we've, we've finished the book. Yeah. Uh, you know, quick synopsis. I liked most of it. Yeah. There's some really cool stuff in there. The quest piece at the end was a bit rushed, I mm. thought. Um, and as you said, you know, you, Elric's never been, for me, a particularly likeable character anyway. Mm. He's always been a bit self-pitying yeah. and self-deluded in this yeah. case, isn't he? Yeah. That's the stuff I like about it. Yeah. That's the stuff I really like. It. All the early stuff with Mel- Melnibonair and how mental it is is yeah. brilliant. Yeah, Absolutely definitely. love all that stuff. The world building and the setup and everything else is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Where it starts to just come a little bit apart... For me, and it's the case with a lot of the Mocock books from the time, is when it gets into quest mode. Yeah, yeah. and it's like the MacGuffin, <clears throat> the companion, yeah. the way of getting from A to B to C, the oh, I've fallen in the swamp. Yeah, yeah, you know that stuff. It's it's all even though because Mocock's style makes it more interesting. Unfortunately, with Mocock's style, if that bit's a bit shit, you're not you know it's not going to last very long. Yeah, and yeah, you're going to exactly. be over it in a page yeah, or two. Yeah. I love the stuff with pig snakes and thing. It's so very Moorcock. And I think you can yeah. t- you take stuff for granted these days because so many people have ripped it off. And Warhammer, yeah, for yeah. example, has completely um, taken all that chaos mutation stuff and, and run with it. So I really, really love all that stuff. And what I really, really enjoy about it is Elric has an arc in the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. From, and essentially, he's still a fool, hmm. but he has a really good arc, despite the fact he comes back full circle and lets Yakun off the hook again. But you know why he does it? Yeah. Because he's desperate for acceptance even from Yakun, and he's desperate for acceptance from the Malnibonians, even though he doesn't want to be one of them. Yeah. And probably desperate for acceptance of the Young Kingdoms as yeah. well, to be honest. Yeah. It's like, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I think it's all, it's, a, it's the f- the first bit of the book is a different character to mm. the rest of the books. Obviously, yeah. so it's building up, and this is it's like year one kind yeah. of thing, isn't it? But it, he's a more interesting character in this, I think, mm. because before you know some of the later books, because of the way they're written and the short stories yeah. and all that kind of stuff, he, he's not very well rounded, as he is very much a being of chaos. Yeah, <clears throat> and I yeah. suppose, it, and it brings in the. The Ariok stuff as well, which is good. Yeah, the thing for me, you know, obviously we're gamers as well, and just just reading this, it, it's you know, Mocock's the influence role playing is more than any other. Oh yeah, more than any other author, I think. It, you know, everybody always goes back to Tolkien because that's the first thing, but all of these are just yeah. ripped off for D and D absolutely for everything, aren't they? I think I think D and D took the trappings of yeah. Middle Earth and Tolkien. But they took the absolute essence yeah, this took, and structure of, yeah, of, of Moorcock. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. With that quest mode and, and just the law and chaos stuff. Mm. And yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's influential, isn't it? It's yeah. written years ago. And we're, as I said before, we're kind of used to those tropes now. And that's yeah. the problem, isn't it? Yeah. And that's why to make the TV show successful. Mm. They're gonna to have to get rid of a lot of the cliches. That mm. it's almost like rewrite a lot of it to make it less. Yeah, because it's not cliche because it came before everything else. But, yeah, you know, you can see lots of people who've never read the books will watch the TV show and go, "Well, I've just watched that in Witcher, or I've just watched yeah. that in this." And that's a big not, risk for them, isn't and it? And that'd be a real shame. And, and I think we have got a fairly recent example of what happens when you don't. Take that into consideration. Did you ever see the John Carter film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The John Carter film doomed itself by being so faithful to the source material. Yeah, yeah. Because everybody who saw it, who wasn't aware of the source material, just go, well, I've seen all this before. Yeah. This is so derivative. But Andrew Stanton made a straight statement very early on that 
I think it was Andrew Stanton, wasn't it, who did it? He made a straight, straight statement earlier on that we are doing a faithful adaptation of, yeah. of Princess of Mars. And now, okay, they, they took elements from the second book as well. They took a few liberties with like the distance you can jump, just yeah. silly things like that, and kind of like made it a little bit more heightened, I suppose. But for the for the most part, that's a really faithful recreation of um, Princess of Mars. And I, when I saw that at cinema, I was I had goosebumps. I was overwhelmed. I found it. Um, re- I was so into it, okay. so into it because yeah, because Princess of Mars was one of the books that pops gave me in the early eighties, and and I was reading that round about yeah. the same time as I was reading World of the Air, and I was reading Stormbringer and Wheels of Terror, yeah, you know, and all that stuff, you know, and also lots of other crap. But so I, I have a real investment in it, and to, and to see it on screen, I was I was quite, I was blown away by it. I was really really taken by it, and I still enjoy you know I still enjoy watching it now. But that is the big risk if you want to make something successful. And I think they're going to have the same problem with June. It'll yeah. be interesting to see what uh, Denny will be interested to see what they do with it. Yeah. Because again, people are going to say, well, you know, things like the voice in mm. June that's been nabbed. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, know. that's the thing. You know, all these little bits have been stolen over time, yeah, or adapted, or you know, little bits of have been used, and yeah. that's going to be the tricky thing. It, it's almost like you know, you're talking about John Carter, and yeah, the the, the way you actually approach Elric's the the main thing, isn't it? the way how are you going to film it as well? Because yeah. you could, in my head, you know, I'm between two minds because. They're not that gritty, mm. really, because you know, th- obviously, they could be. You could yeah. interpret and do a, like a Game of Thrones grittiness, yeah. but also you could do a Luke Besson style Fifth Element, yeah. you know, Valerian, Valerian and shit. But yeah. some of the images and go for that ultra mental sixties psychedelic yeah. kind of approach. And if you did that, it would. Potentially work, but it'd be it would alienate a massive amount of audience if mm. you had just like this crazy ass kind of you know mega fantasy Rodney Matthews kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. So it depends how they do it, but I think this you would assume that this would be the first book. Yeah. The first series would build all this up. Yeah. Unless you did the flashback stuff, but. Yeah. It's, it'll be interesting. To see, I mean, if it ever even happens, yeah, yeah. It will be interesting to see how to solve some of these problems. Yeah. So yeah, that's Elric of Malnibane, and it will be interesting to move on at some point and read the next story chronologically, which I think would be the first story of Sailor on the Seas of Fate, whatever that is. I can't remember. Off that's top of my the first head. one I read. Yeah, Sailor on the Seas of Fate. So I think after reading the, the style of this, how jarring will it be going back to reading stuff written back in the mid sixties again? Be interesting to see. The, the first, the first couple of pages of Sailor on the Seas of Fate are really, really cool. Yeah. And really well written, yeah. and it's. Um, I just remember it because he, it starts off with Elric. I think he's being chased by somebody, and he rides his horse till its heart burst, yeah. and he's on this like. Well, he's obviously on a beach, and there's just it says like the fog is like a cave, and everything. Yeah. It's really, really evocative. It's yeah. really good. Well, we'll get and to that at some point. And then it gets utterly mental. Mm. <laughs> but we'll get to that at some point. But of course, uh, the uh, the Twitter poll has spoken. It has. And disappointed that I am that Dennis and the Dark Straits of Regolithium was rejected by the listenership. Yeah, I know that I you're not particularly. <laughs> thank, thank the Lord, <laughs> so I don't have to read it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm impressed that you even bought it just to humour me. Well, it's, I think it's about fifty p to be honest, but uh, <laughs> and that was a signed gold plated copy. Yeah, um, yeah. So luckily, we've got King, uh, sorry, Knight the Sword, the Knigget of Swords. Yeah, which is the first Mocock book I ever read, yeah. and it's still one of my favourite ones. Yeah, and Coram's probably one of my favourite characters. I think. Mm. So, well, I shall uh, look forward to to getting into the old Coram business. Yeah. And you know, eventually we'll we'll even get to things like Sailor on the Seas Affair and ridiculous crossovers. Mm. But before we do that, we are going to have to suck it up and do Ericos at some point. We are mm. Mm. because we've got we've, we've got to complete the circle. We have, and I've not read the second what the Elix Scar School or whatever it is. Uh, Phoenix and Obsidian. Yeah, I've not read or that for years. the Silver Warriors in America. Yeah, I've not read that one for years. Yeah, the Ericos era recently. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And once we get, into, we'll have to do War Under Wild Pain to introduce Von Beck. 
Which is, uh, yeah, which again, is, one of my faves. I yeah, like um, interesting to see that Von Beck actually drew with Danis. He did, yeah. 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 So, we know what we're doing, anyway. We so, did. once again, Loz, thanks as ever no for uh, for getting involved and being uh, my co-host for uh, Elric of Melnia Bene Part 3. That's so, cool. in the meantime, let's get rid of this disgusting beer. Yeah, it's absolutely me. Get it's onto real... something more impressive. Um, and and to everybody else out there, we'll see you on the Moonbeam Roads. Ta-da! As always, thanks to Lars for being such a great co-host on Breakfast in the Ruins. This was our fourth show together and the first time the show has actually managed to conclude coverage of a Marcock novel. And we've had quite a few discussions, Loz and I, regarding what to go for next, and I think it's fair to say we didn't quite see eye to eye. As highlighted in the introductory episode where Phil and I discussed the rationale behind the show, as well as Mocock, I do want to occasionally cover odd bits and pieces that made their way to me via the hands of Pops and my uncles, both good and bad. With that in mind, I urge Loz to pick up a copy of Mike Sirota's Danus and the Dark Straits of Reglavium. And he did so, just to humour me, to be fair. After reading a couple of pages, though, I could hear him groaning right from the other side of the Pennines. Therefore, knowing that there are other key Mocock characters we do need to delve into, I decided to throw it open to our patrons and Twitter pals to decide. The poll was between Coram's first appearance in The Night of Swords, the first appearance of John Dacre, a.k.a. Erikos, in The Eternal Champion, Danis and the Dark Straits of Reglathium, and finally, The Warhound and the World's Pain, in which the key, and probably most prolific latter-day character, of Von Beck is introduced. Much to Loz's relief, the Knight of Swords won out by quite a clear margin. Amazingly, though, Danis did tie for second with Von Beck, with Erikos stumbling in at a sad fourth and last place. That massive bearskin hat must have slowed him down a bit. So the next time Loz and I sit down again, we'll be looking at the epic, violent tale of Coram, last of his kind. As I record this, Phil and I are in Cornwall, which is quite timely considering. You may have heard the songs of seagulls in the background, if I've not got my noise reduction right anyway. We're on the coast, and as it happens, we have a view straight over the bay to Moidal's Mount. I was hoping that fate would throw some nice second-hand mocock my way in one of the numerous second-hand books and charity shops, but it's been slim pickings on that front and the only one I came across was the third of the original Von Beck trilogy, The Dragon in the Sword, in a rather lovely first edition hardcover. Signed, too. It was a bit pricey, though, so I walked away. However, it's been nagging at me ever since, so I may end up going back for it. Meanwhile, thanks as ever to our patrons. Chaos Engineers, Norman, Fred, Malpertius, David, Tom, and Matt. And thanks to everybody on Twitter for the continuing encouragement and kind words and thanks and particularly to Pat and Kiha for the five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts. Pat said, Absolutely riveting. Fantastic audio. Well-spoken. Well-produced. More, more and more, please. Thanks, Pat. And Kiha said, Covering a breadth of Mocock's work and adding a range of voices to the conversation, this lyrical podcast manages to gently cover the master with reflections across the written word and his greater cultural footprint. Required listening. Thanks, Kiha. I'm going to give a shout-out too to another contributor to our Mocox birthday episode, Michael from Germany, also known as Sauce the Rope on Twitter, who's branching out his presence on the Bibliophile Adventures podcast to launch his own personal show, The Noble Art of Running Away. Episode zero is out now. And finally, I need to belatedly thank Dirk the Dice for name-checking Breakfast in the Ruins as his most entertaining podcast of 2019 in his end-of-year review. High prayers indeed coming from the Grogfather. Whilst there is evidently a big section of the Venn diagram where RPG gamers intersect with Mocock fans, I just need to say that even if you're not a gamer and you listen to this podcast, Dirk and Blythe's coverage of the Stormbringer role-playing game on the Grognard files is essential listening for lovers of Mocock. And what's more, their enthusiasm and good humour might even make you RPG curious. If you want to get in touch, then check us out on Twitter at the handle at Breakfast Ruins. We're also Breakfast Ruins on Instagram. For what it's worth, I don't really get Instagram, to be honest. Or you can email breakfastruins at outlook.com. Right. 
I hear the song of the swords. A transition approaches, so take it easy pads. And for those affected by the flooding in the UK, stay safe. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, I'll see you on the Moonbeam Roads.